That's true. <laughs> That's very true. And and Ron could just shout through the gates different mistakes they made in the liner notes. Oh my god, that would be awesome. <laughs> now I would pay for Ron's airfare to see that happen. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That would be great. Okay, letter number eight. You knew this was coming, Dave. It's always sneaking from behind like a knife in the back. Speak of the devil. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Midwest fucking Ron. It is Mr. Midwest Ron, and he is back, and he says, Daves, thank you for the lively discussion about the Van Halen Rock and Roll Hall of Fame nomination slash induction subject. What is worse, being nominated and not getting in? or not being nominated at all. Examples. Sex Pistols were nominated five times before getting in. Patti Smith was nominated seven times before getting in. Some acts have been nominated up to 11 times and still haven't gotten in. At least Van Halen got in the first year they were nominated. Midwest fucking Ron. Okay, that's all fine and good, and your point is taken, Ron. But I'm sorry. We're talking about Van Halen here. The Sex Pistols and Patti Smith are nothing on the musical landscape in comparison. Ed is an all-time guitar innovator that changed the game. So now you explain this to me, Mr. Ron. Guns N' Roses inducted the first year they were eligible. Same thing with Pearl Jam. Same thing with R.E.M. You can't grant the mighty Van Halen the same courtesy? What do you think? I think it's worse to keep getting nominated and not win. Yeah, that's true. I mean, just ask Susan Lucci, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Susan Lucci. So to answer Ron's question, but, I mean, some of the other bands he listed, I mean, look at the Sex Pistols. They finally get in, and they don't show up. But that's their M.O. Well, I know. But not only don't they show up, they basically write an F.U. letter to Jan. <laughs> and to his credit, he reads it. I know. Of course he did. <laughs> You know, but so that was pretty funny. That was but funny. It's, you know, listen, if you want to have a five hour podcast, like w- 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 was alluded to in the first letter, yeah, just start having us going off on the rock and roll. Oh, forget thing. it. You can go all day. <laughs> right. You can go all day. So that's like, you know, that's old news, and we'll never get tired of complaining about that. That's and true. just the sad cluster that was. Of the Van Halen induction. Absolutely. And letter number nine comes from Dave Moses. He says, fellas, okay, you caught me. I'm not the third Dave. It's just me. Good old fourth Dave. But I was thinking maybe David Lee Roth was out, or isn't he? But just to be safe, I'll be the fourth Dave. I wanted to bring your thoughts on why the bands lose their touch for writing the way they do when they are on fire and creating classic music. Even when you go through some old classic record discographies of some of the great bands that have times when what they wrote loses the magic. Some loses it forever. Sometimes it comes and goes. For sure, the most important things is who is involved and who is part of the process? All original members, for sure, and depending, sometimes the original producer helps as well as a sound engineer as well. Every little bit helps, even same album cover artists, stage design, everything helps. But my real question beyond all this is, is it the times that dictate so much of the greatest? Could the Beatles write anything close to what they did? Can VH? Could anyone? Or is it so tied into the times? Many experiments have happened over time to study this. David Lee Roth with Ted Templeman, but a new band. Van Halen with Dave, but not Mike. Ed playing with Sam, etc. The formula comes real close when all original members are involved, but what do you think might cause the music to be affected by the times and the culture beyond this? What's your take? The fourth Dave, Dave Moses. Well... Keeping the fire burning in a band is not easy. And I have to say, Van Halen had a great run. So from 78 to 84, I consider perfect. You want to bitch about Diver Down? Fuck you. Perfect. (laughs) All right. So 1986 to 1995. Fantastic. The, The band had a couple of missteps here and there. I would say, you know, like the production on OE812, I think that was a little rush, blah, blah, blah. Little things here and there. You know, the lyrics on Amsterdam, like little, little stupid things, but nothing crazy, okay? The electronic drums on 5150, little things I'd fix, but overall fantastic. 1986 to 1998, a little wobbly, 
We're getting a little wobbly there. It's a little wonky, you know. 2004? Uh-oh. We're in trouble. It's a little <laughs> weird. But then 2007 to 2015, I'd say it's really good, very strong. People point to Van Halen 3 as sort of the Bombs Away album, but I really think it could have been better if they had a proper producer helming the project. Ed's alcoholism took its toll, and you can only party for so long. But I really believe, and we've said this a thousand times, we have an entire podcast dedicated to it, is a different kind of truth is amazing and a miracle if you think about it. If you go back and listen to it and appreciate it. You miss Van Halen music, you want Van Halen music, go listen to that album. That needs to be appreciated more. However, I think Van Halen needs a closer. I think they need one killer album and tour to really cap it off on this massive career. I don't think this band has the Stones' energy or endurance. So one more is all I can ask for. What do you think, Dave? Oh, wait a minute. I didn't even answer the question. I apologize. So (laughs) is it tied to the times? Yeah, I mean, when you're young and creative... Of course, it's tied to the times. And, you know, there's only so much juice, you know, that you can get out of an orange. You know, after a while, it's going to go dry. But I think Van Halen had a nice long run. Any artist has a creative period that is so rich and they mine it. And sometimes they can mine it for a really long time. And then you get like something like the Stones. Like the Stones are really just a miracle. Then in like 1981, right? And the Stones are around for like 20 years. And back then, 20 years that a rock band was going for 20 It was insane. In 1981, maybe it's like 1982 when it's 20 years. But whatever. So you figure around like 19, 20 years, whatever. And they came out with a hit like Start Me Up. And Start Me Up was sort of a leftover track from 1975 that they reworked. It was originally sort of like a reggae tune called Bulldog. And they reworked it into this unbelievable radio staple that plays every day all the time. That does happen. There is gold in them bar hills. That's for sure. When you get, but someone like Eddie Van Halen, okay, you know, someone like Eddie, he's got gems. He does. He's got gems in 5150. Now, you got to realize, it's not just, they don't come out fully formed. So, like, Ed's got great hooks and gems, but it's when Dave takes it and mixes it with his magic, and then the producer puts it there. It's like, there's a lot of people that got to make it right. You know what I mean? Like, 1984, it sounds great because... Dave mixes his magic with Ed's, and then Ted Templeman and and Don Landy put their producing and sound technology on it, and it comes out to be an incredible product. But yeah, I, I do think it's tied to the times, but I also think with certain people that are really, really incredible musicians that are rich, they can really come up with some great gold later on in their years. But it all depends on who it is. You know what I mean? Like the Stones are unbelievable. Tom Petty, some of the greatest stuff. And later in his career, you know, like, you know, different things. But not everybody's the same. It's pretty common for a band, you know, to lose its uh, mojo early on. But what do you think, Dave? I think it's definitely, at least in part, tied to the times. Yeah. I mean, you, you are of that time. Right. So that's definitely a part of it. But like you said, I think it's hard to keep up that consistency. Either you lose your inspiration or you still have your inspiration, but you're inspired to write different kinds of songs. And maybe that just doesn't click with everybody else. So I think that's part of it as well. So I I think it's really hard to just be like ACDC all the time and say, hey, we're going to we're going to keep doing the same album again and again and and get away with it. Oh, yeah. Because, I mean, in ACDC's case, people love that. They want the same thing over and over. That's but true. with other bands, that's not always the case. Or the artists themselves, they get bored. Yeah. I mean, Ed wanted to explore different things. Yeah. And, and, and he did. Yeah. He and, did and, and a lot of people jumped on the train with him. And a, and a lot of people jumped off that train. Right. So it all depends on the musical taste. And I think you just, as an artist, you just got to go with your gut and not try and please everybody all the time. That's true. That's very true. And letter number 10 comes from Brian McMurtry. And he says, dudes, my cousin Todd was probably a bigger Van Halen fan than me. He went to every tour from 1986 on uh, when he turned 14. 
He contracted mesothelioma in 2015 and got very sick very quickly. He had tickets to see Van Halen on the 2015 tour, and although he was extremely thick, he still made it to the concert. He passed in November of that year, and his passion was cars, so his sister had his classic duster fixed up to race. And the car's name is Unchained. Well, Brian, nice. that's that's a, that's a heavy, heavy message. Brian, we're so sad to hear about Todd. I love his dedication, though, and it sounds like he was a, a fun guy, and he's one of our people, and he would have been maybe a listener to this podcast. And so, Todd, we honor you and your hot rod, the uh, Van Halen car, and uh, I'm so sorry to hear about your loss, Brian. Do anything to say there, Dave? No, I think you said it all. Okay, all right, cool. We are on to letter number 11, and this comes from... Robert Burton, and he says, I've been listening to David Lee Roth's Roth Show podcast. As you guys have noted, it's pretty much a stream of conscious spew that's hard to follow because Dave seldom finishes a point before raising three more. Anyways, the thing that's interesting to me is that despite the incredible amount of drugs that I'm sure Dave has consumed over the past 40 years, his memory seems to be amazingly intact. He's pulled out microbial details from stories that are decades old. It's really astounding. He's a true collector of experiences, which he then regurgitates into Technicolor lyrics. Discuss amongst yourselves. Keep up the awesome work, and I await notice from Apple that your next show is available for listing. And then he also says... D plus and D negative to the positive and negative days. That's so mean. I really en- <laughs> I, I enjoyed listening to the audio bash. It's always interesting to hear Ben's attempt to cover Van Halen. It's like hearing someone tell another comedian's joke. You recognize all the material, but the timing and delivery is always a hair different. That gives me real insight into the untouchable magic blend that's Van Halen. Uh, speaking of covers, and in my humble opinion, Jake Dereps. D-E-R-A-P-S, comes the closest of all the impersonators to Eddie's real feel. I've never heard you mention him before, and here's a link of him performing at the Montreal Jazz Fest. And check his videos out on YouTube, and I think you'll be impressed. And he sent us a link. So, now, Dave's podcast. Yes, it is all over the place. And he kind of just goes off in different directions. I was listening to him the other day, and he says things like, there's no Buddhism before happy hour. I'm the face of Las Vegas. I'm the vibe of Las Vegas. When they say party like a rock star, who do you think they mean? So he's pounding his chest over there. And he, <laughs> he just kind of goes off uh, all over the place. He's uh, quite a card, Dave, although he is colorful in the process and very detailed in his descriptions. How does he remember all that? I don't know. Maybe he's making some of it up. How would we ever even know? I have no idea, but Dave is quite a character, and he's fun. So Jacob Dereps, yes, he's amazing, and I think he uses a Wolfgang guitar, so that helps in terms of his sound. But one thing people do in imitating Ed, especially with Eruption, is they rush through it a lot. They need to give it a little more time to breathe. So that would be my comments on that. Dave, what do you think? This is what I wanted to uh, mention before earlier in the podcast. Uh Dave can remember great detail. And I would love for him to sit back and tell stories about Van Halen in the day. Thank God, yes. Since he remembers all that stuff. But he will not tell linear stories like everybody else. And that's what makes it frustrating for me. If somebody could find the secret sauce and have him sit down and just tell a few stories of stuff that happened back in the day. That would be awesome. It really would. That would be interesting. But Absolutely. he's not interested in thinking like that. No, he's not. No, not at all. And the guitarist yeah. that was mentioned, yeah, he's really good. Yeah, he definitely exactly. has Ed's tone down. Absolutely. He's He's something to behold, yes. Totally. Letter number 12 comes from Jason E.R. Jamerson, and he says, I heard the story about the wristwatch before. He's referring to the Bart Walsh interview. But to hear Bart Walsh tell it had me cracking up. One of the better eps loved the Sam content that was generally negative. I took a shot every time Dave said wow and passed out before the end of the podcast. (laughs) So, Dave, we are inciting (laughs) drinking games. Can you believe this? Well, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, if you're doing shots, 
you should uh, have a shot every time I say you know.